Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how a journal works. Um, and so, you know, just prepare yourself. Your paper is going to be reviewed by experts and it's extremely likely to need revisions. Um, uh, so what I want to talk about is sort of submitting a paper uh, first. And, you know, the first bit I would say, follow directions. This is the thing that people are really terrible at and is infuriating. Um, all journals have an instructions to authors. Read this. If you don't have time, think about it from my point of view. You don't have time to read the directions, I don't have time to read your paper, right? Um, so there are things like instructions to authors there, which talk about how long they should be. Um, in conservation biology, which I, 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 is a great resource, they also have what they call a style guide for authors, and it contains all the detailed information, how to format it, tells you what to do, double space the text, number the lines, don't use footnotes, use metric measurements, blah, blah, blah. All of the information you need is here, you just have to read it first. What most people do is they've sent it somewhere else, they reformat the references, or some of them, and send it on. And that never goes over well. It's, it's very poorly received. Things are much better received when you pay attention to the details and that. But the one thing I want to just emphasize here, this style guide, and then there's, they have another guide on there as well. Um, and it's really, really helpful. It talks a lot about things that you just, ge like general rules for scientific papers, about things you should do and shouldn't do. And so this is actually a great resource for, uh, for writers. Um, so yeah, read, read the instructions to authors. You also have to include a cover letter in there, right? And what I want you to do is just take a look at an example of a, a, a cover letter um, uh, that I've given here. And so what are the different things that are in there? Well, first, you know, use the editor's name. This was a little bit different because I was on the editorial board, so it would have been weird for me to say your <coughs> Professor Adger and the, uh, Professor Conway. Like, I, you know, I was in communication with them regularly, so it would be sort of weird. So in this case, I used their first name. If you don't know them on a first name basis, don't use their first name. Um, but if you do, then, it, then it's okay. Um, uh, so, identify related work if applicable. Like, if you've done other stuff that this builds on, let them know about that. So this was something that we've been doing and it's part of this other body of work. I do that because, you know, I just think it's fair to let them know that this isn't the first piece, whatever, that's using these data or whatever. Um, be honest with what you're doing. Highlight opportunities to inform policy. Um, and recommend reviewers. These are all the things that you want to do in, um, uh, in there. One of the interesting things, I told you guys that I actually gave this talk with, uh, with, with Neil Adger, he helped me give this once, and he noticed something that I'd forgotten. He said when he handled this paper, he took a look at that and said, boy, this person's really dedicated. I'll actually, I'll send it out for review quickly, so. <laughs> um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the review process. We're gonna go through and map it. What happens when you hit that submit button? Where's it go? Well, the first thing that happens when you hit that submit button is it goes to the editor-in-chief. She or he can reject it right away, it's not appropriate, send it back, or advance it. When it gets advanced, it goes to either an associate editor or a handling editor. That's kind of my role in these journals. I'm a handling editor. So the editor or chief sends it to me and it's my job to make an assessment of it or send it out for review or not. I can recommend rejecting it. Here's an example of that. Dear Dr. So-and-so, thanks for submitting your research note to conservation biology. The work appears to be robust, but conservation biology is not a good fit. We prioritize prioritize manuscripts with relevance to conservation that transcends the particular ecosystem, species, or situation described. Uh, we typically don't publish the work on a single species, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, whatever. The discovery of new markers is not strongly linked to population level analysis or to the ecology of the species. So I'm declining it without sending it for review. 
uh, send it to a journal focused on conservation genetics or something on salmonids, right? Because that was it was a very species specific thing. Um, here's another one. Um, you know, thanks for submitting it to so and so. I sent the manuscript to, to handling editor Josh Sinner. He commented. They make an effort to put their study in a conservation context, appreciate the need to better understand how populations of migratory species are structured, if we're to manage them, and it's clear that they're working in an information poor area, so this basic information is needed, and a lot of work went into this. However, I didn't feel conservation biology was a good fit for a paper on population structure of one fish, because it doesn't seem to transcend ecosystems or disciplines, nor does it define a novel pr problem or f really find a solution. So maybe send it to a more specialized journal, right? And it, the editor says, I think this is fair, and so we're going to decline it. We thought about whether it could be in another format, but we actually ultimately didn't think so. So that's what it can look like. This is typically what you get when editors care a lot. Um, what you often get is a one line that just do whatever, a standard form letter. Um, this one is my favorite one to show people. So if you notice, this was Dear Dr. McClanahan, that's Tim McClanahan. I was a co-author on this paper as well, and I want you to read that bit there. <laughs> <laughs> I regret that the English is not at a level that would allow us to send the paper out for review, therefore we'll be unable to consider it for publication. <laughs> Seriously, between the two of us, we'd written like 250 papers. And uh, they decided that our English wasn't good enough. No. Is that American English? It must be the American English. I think you're right. This is a British journal. So that must have been it. You know, we used, didn't use the U's. It was just unbearable. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, if you, get a, if you get one like this, you're not alone. Right? It's happened before. Uh, so we can, you know, it can go to the, the, the editor and we can recommend a revision. Right? And this might look something like this. Thanks for sitting it. I sent it to Tim and then to handling editor Josh. My comments are pasted below on the basis of his concerns. I'm rejecting the manuscript. However, as he recommends, I'm willing to consider a resubmission that fully addresses the concerns. Resubmitting it does not guarantee eventual acceptance and it will be subject, subject to the full peer review process. What happened in this case is I took a look at the manuscript and I said, there's, there's cool stuff in here, but this is not going to go well in peer review. Right? And I knew there was some real bad, there were some real things wrong with it that were fixable, but were probably going to result in it being rejected. So I had them do some changes, and I can't really remember, maybe it got, uh, it probably got accepted in the end, I don't know. Um, and then I could also, as a handling editor, recommend advancing it and sending it on to a reviewer. Right? And so, Here's an example of someone sending me one. Dear Dr. Sinner, this manuscript entitled this with so-and-so. Oh, so this is interesting, right? This happens less and less now because things are becoming double blind, right? In this case, with so-and-so as a contact author, has been submitted to environmental conservation. The abstract appears here. I'd be grateful if you'd review it. Uh, let me know as soon as possible, blah, 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 blah. More and more, we're not finding out who the author or authors are. It's, we're moving more towards a double-blind system and every journal that I currently edit for, and three, and the fourth one that I used to edit for, have all moved to a double-blind review system. In fact, Ecology and Society was the only one that's been double-blind for the whole time. But recently there's been a, a, a switch towards double-blind review. It's fair and it's good. It's actually interesting though. You get more manuscripts rejected going double blind. You're more likely to have a manuscript rejected because there's no old boys club to fall back on and they actually evaluate it on the merits of the science rather than the reputation of the scientist and that leads to more rejections. Um, so some things to think about, right? It's a subjective process that people try to conduct objectively but it's not, right? Uh, people are busy so expect three months minimum. Um, Remember that people don't get paid for reviews, right? They, I don't get paid for, for doing this. This is stuff that I tend to do in my free time. Um, it's not the reviewer's job to fix your manuscript, right? Don't submit something that's not good, right? It's not, it's not my job to fix your problems. My job is to make a recommendation to the editor. 
as to whether it should be rejected or not. And if it's not very good, if there's a lot of messy things in there, I'm not going to spend my time fixing them. I'm going to tell the editor that they shouldn't accept it. Uh, reviewers are less inclined to be helpful if you waste their time, right? If you don't do a spell check, if you didn't follow directions, if your references aren't what's in the paper. If I see a reference that I think sounds interesting and I go to look for it in your bibliography and it's not there, uh, that I think you're wasting my time, you're being sloppy, I'm, I'm less inclined to be helpful and really uh, supportive. Like, you know, you can be very constructive, but I tend not to really want to spend my time with people that I think are wasting my time. Um, recognize that people make mistakes. Reviewers might not have read something right. They may have misunderstood it. They can make a mistake, and editors will often listen to reason. So the reviewer can accept it as is. It's happened before. It's been a while for me, but it's, it's happened. They can suggest some degree of revision. They can suggest a sort of reject, but consider resubmitting. That basically, to me, means that there's so many changes that are needed that it's fundamentally going to be a different manuscript, but that the journal should still consider it because it's of interest and it's important. Um, or they could recommend rejecting it. So that then goes back to the editor who may have additional input or may say, you know what, I think this needs to go out for review again. Maybe sent it out to a couple of people and they actually said, hey, look, I actually don't know about this type of analysis and I think you should get an expert in that. So then I may send it to somebody in that. So I may have taken three months to get the reviews back but then I'm going to go send it to another round of review because everyone said that they don't understand the analysis. Then I send it to the editor-in-chief who then sends it to the author. They send the reviews back. And this can look something like, whatever, Dear Dr. So-and-so, thanks for submitting it. I've received four constructive reviews and the comments and recommendations the handling editor, Josh Center. Full set of comments and reviews are pasted below. On the basis of these reviews, I invite you to respond to the comments and submit a revised manuscript for potential publication. Right, so that's what it looks like when you get that. Um, it can also look, you know, reviews kind of can look a little bit weird. I've gotten, these are reviews that I had a while back. Uh, the reviewer's comments, one, oh, it prevents a complete analysis of this, a few specific comments, which is well written, whatever, this line seems repeated, this should have been a different, I should have put the parentheses there. That was the, and then this one, this reviewer, paper addresses an important issue of assessing social vulnerability of coastal communities that depend on read resources. However, there's a fundamental flaw in the way it conceptualizes and assesses this. It mixes metrics for assessing the vulnerability of biophysical and human components of coral reef resource use. While these two system interacts, an analysis of vulnerability has to build from parallel analyses and using appropriate indicators. So what this person, what this reviewer is saying is there is no such thing as a linked social ecological system. You should do them separately in silos. We'll get back to that. Uh, so dealing with the reviews, can you make the corrections? Is it worth it? Maybe there's a lot to do and uh, it's hard. Um, one thing I would argue is if you can, even if you get rejected, from a journal, and you've gotten reviews, make those revisions. I can't tell you how many times I've reviewed a paper. Recommended, sometimes you recommend rejection, sometimes you recommend major revisions. I then get it a couple of weeks later in another journal, and they haven't done anything. So I spent half my Saturday on this person's paper and they've completely ignored all of the advice and just sent it somewhere else. So when I was constructive and helpful the first time, now I know they're wasting my time and I'm less constructive and helpful about the <laughs> same points that I had before, right? So then I went from probably a major revision to this should be rejected. Because they're, if they're not gonna do it, they should just don't, don't bother giving them a chance. Um, 
you can argue the referee's points if they're seriously mistaken. Um, one interesting thing to, to note is you're much more likely to be successful arguing technical issues than you are sort of philosophical ones. Um, you're going to have a much harder time arguing that. Whereas if somebody thinks that you've done the wrong analysis and you're convinced you haven't, you can actually get rejections overturned quite easily. I've done that multiple times. Generally, just make the corrections and include the following. A cover letter on how you addressed it and a separate letter that notes how you've addressed the, um, uh, uh, the reviewer's suggestions. Do it point by point as a response to the reviewers. And um, we're gonna go over a way to do that in a, uh, in a little bit. Um, so what I suggest when you're responding to reviewer and editor comments, always start with what you've done. Start a sentence with, to address these comments, we have done the following. What most people do is argue with the reviewer first about why they thought they were right, and then they explain what they've done about it. That's a terrible idea. It's an absolutely terrible idea. Your dream is that it doesn't go back out to review. That is the best case scenario for you, is that you send it to the editor and they say, check, 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 check. looks great, done. The worst case scenario is that it goes back out to review. The worst case scenario, totally different reviewers because those ones aren't available. The way to ensure that it goes back out to review is by arguing every point, even though you've actually addressed it. But if you're just like arguing with the points, the reviewers, the editors can say, okay, this has got to go back out to review because the issue is not resolved yet. And I'll let the reviewers determine whether it's resolved. So I just want to give this example from one of the papers I was working on with a, a student of mine. I'm sorry, it's, it's quite small, but I wanted to just uh, go over a few of the ways that, they, uh, that the student responded. So I'm not convinced that this is novel. So, so we changed that part. We agree we missed this. However, we, you know, we did put these things in there. You know, we agree that we need to more directly address solutions. But OK, what did you do? You didn't tell me what you did. We chose this as a cutoff design by this, and we did this, so we're right, is what she, they're saying here. We're right, you're wrong. This has got to go out for review. I changed this a little bit, right? Uh, I'm not convinced. Okay, so we've done two things to address this comment. We deleted this analysis, we made this much more explicit about how this is, uh, builds on previous work and is novel. And here's the sentence that we've done to say this. And then I argue with them. But that's fine, that's later on. They've already known that we've done that. Again, same thing here. We've specifically addressed this comment by adding the following paragraph. Right? That is way better than we agree that we should do something about it. Right? So I'm very, very clear in the first instance about what we've done. Now at this point, I actually we argue with the reviewer on this one, but so but first we appreciate this. It's important to understand that what this person's suggesting would take months of calculations and cost tens of thousands of dollars, right? Because what they wanted was us to go from 10 by 10 kilometer squares grids to one kilometer grids. So this increases things a couple orders of magnitude. And so I said, you know, you've given us two weeks to do these revisions, but we'd have to write a research grant. It would take more than the two weeks in supercomputer time to do it. So I appreciate that this would be a better thing. And if you've got several million dollars, we'll do it. Let us know, you know. So, but, so and this worked. We got this through. They, they agreed with all that. So again, my suggestion is always start with what you've done. Right, what you've done to address the comments and maybe argue later. Uh, so responding to reviewers, right? So here's the sort of cover letter that I uh, I wrote there, thanks for the opportunity to revise it. We'd like to thank reviewers for their time, blah, blah, blah. One and two provided minor but helpful suggestions. We just addressed some of the comments made by reviewer three. Although we appreciate the reviewer's opinions, we disagree with a number of the issues raised. And the assessment's inconsistent with the minor corrections recommended by the other two reviewers, and indeed our vision of the manuscript. And then I go on. 
Reviewer 3 has a very different vision of what this paper should be and recommended revisions that are irreconcilable with the goals of the manuscript and inconsistent with the very positive responses for 1 and 2. To illustrate, Reviewer 3 seems most interested in examining whether the indicators we used were related to retrospective impact from previous bleaching events by way of a stepwise correlation. To our knowledge, we do not think this analysis exists. Right? That we don't need, they weren't even talking, they weren't even making sense. There's no such thing as a stepwise correlation. There's stepwise regressions, but things are either correlated or they're not. So we basically just went on to basically say this reviewer was crazy and, uh, and that they should ignore them. And sure enough, they did. Remember, though, that the review is, not a, is about a paper, not a person. So we weren't disparaging the reviewer, we're disparaging what they said. Um, and remember that the reviewers are often friends of the editors. So telling them that they're crazy and that they're stupid and they're bit, it's never going to help you out. It's typically going to dig the hole deeper. But saying that, oh, well, look, they suggested this analysis that doesn't even exist, and you know they talked about it, uh, whatever. It, this is the one that said that you shouldn't link social and ecological systems, and that runs counter to this body, you know, seventy thousand citations or hundred thousand citations of Carl Folk, or you know. So um, I've got to, got around that. Respond to each point. Explain why any points were not addressed in the revision, and that was the example I gave of well, this would cost millions of dollars and take weeks on a supercomputer. That's why we weren't able to do that. Always make life as easy as possible for the reviewers and editors. If you think you're busy, the reviewer is much more time limited because what they're doing is free. Uh, and always be polite. Right? So then you send your revised manuscript back to the editor-in-chief. This can happen two, three, or even more times. The paper I published in Nature went through six rounds of reviews. It's crazy, but that, that's, that's the game. You can do this a lot. Sometimes the editor-in-chief, after it's sort of been accepted, will send it to a copy editor, not all journals, who will then send the edits back, and then send it to the publisher, who will then send you the proofs. The proofs are when they put it in their format, and they want you to take a last look at it to make sure they haven't screwed up. They usually do. Uh, when you get the proofs back, you want to ensure that the meaning is correct. They typically change things and don't tell you. Um, ensure that the typesetting is correct, especially important for tables and figures and equations. They may have shifted something. Um, it is not the time for rewriting. Don't rewrite your paper now. You can change a word or two, but this is not when you should be getting charged up about your paper and uh, getting involved in a whole new set of literature. Uh, the ship sailed for that. Ultimately, they're the author's responsibility. It's not if the editor makes a mistake and you accept it, it's your mistake. Let me give you a great example. This was a paper we published in Nature a few years back. I wasn't the lead author on this one. But here's an interesting thing. GBR used to say the Great Barrier Reef. They somehow decided that we didn't mean the Great Barrier Reef when we were talking about coral reefs. We meant Great Britain, because that's the thing there. So now, we've got in nature the reefs of Great Britain. <laughs> it's our fault. We, should have, we were supposed to find that. I don't know how we'd find that, but we were supposed to find that. It's our fault. We approved the proofs. Pay very, very close attention to what you're doing. I strongly recommend having two screens and going through, literally line by line and everything and seeing what they changed. Uh, so you get to approve the proof, do a better job than we did, um, and then usually the paper's published uh, usually online first. So I always love this. Most scientists regard the new streamlined peer review process as quite an improvement. You gotta run the gauntlet of chainsaws and swords and bats and the Grim Reaper, and that's just, uh, it's much nicer than the system I've just described. <laughs> Okay, so just a quick summary of sort of after acceptance. Um, you know, the final version submitted, sent to the publisher, uh, the proof sent to the author for correction, there's the copyright and page charges, and you know, they used to do reprints, it's not that common anymore in the age of PDFs. 
Uh, reprints were just the sort of glossy one, uh, uh, copies of it that you got from the, uh, the publisher. The managing editor assembles the issue, the publication comes out, sent to the libraries, the reprints and PDFs are sent to authors, use Twitter or whatever to send it out to all your people, and then you get citations. So that's the, that's the flow.